missing person turns up dead, the family is thrown into turmoil. Me and my sister were close. We were best friends. When they took her, they took a part of me. Can Dr. David Glassman figure out what happened to this little girl in her final hours? Anytime you're working with children, it becomes a very, very important case to all of us. Then, when a skull is found in the woods, Detectives wonder if these could be the remains of a young woman they've been trying to track down for the past year. There was uh, evidence that somebody could have been killed or they were hurt very bad. With just a skull, an arm bone, and two ribs to go on, they are counting on Dr. Michael Warren to figure out who this person is. And in cases where we have just a few bones, it's even a more intense hunt. Texas. Two boys are on their way to play ball until something grabs their attention. It's a human skeleton. The boys rush home and phone the local police department. I believe that was on a Sunday morning right after 10 a.m. I was in church. They said they'd found a body the discovery means church is over and a homicide investigation begins. At first, Detective Inahosa expects this to be a typical case of a drifter or petty criminal killed after a drug dispute. Somebody that got stabbed or shot last night got dumped in the creek bottom. That's what I was thinking. But a closer inspection reveals something that makes the case even more tragic and heartbreaking. But it was the remains of a small child. I knew it wasn't an adult by the size. Police believe the bones may be the remains of missing nine-year-old Trini Gonzalez, who mysteriously vanished almost two years earlier. Since then, she's remained in the forefront of every local police officer's mind. She'd been missing one year, nine months, 13 days, 11 hours. As it possibly could be Trini. Because Trini had, had become so personal to us, the reality hit us that much harder. Police are unsure if this is Trini, but the child-sized skeleton brings to mind the missing girl they grew to know so well from the loving portrait others painted of her. Trini was so beautiful, and she would love to sing and be outside jumping row and play with her dolls. She was very good little granddaughter. My sister was a very outgoing person. She loved people. She would just go up to people and just say hi and how are you doing. And my sister loved everybody. She was a happy person. At the time of her disappearance, Trini was being raised by her great aunt Frances Smithwick. She was the only mother Trini ever knew. And one morning, 22 months ago, Frances awoke to every mother's worst nightmare. Trini's great aunt explained that Trini had gone to bed the night before. The next morning, she wasn't in her bed. She told the officer that somebody might have taken her from the house when everybody was asleep during the night. Police mobilize every officer on the force, determined to track down Trini. They know the chances of finding a kidnapping victim alive dwindle with every hour and day that passes. Trini's disappearance also brings together members of the community. Local parents realized Trini could just as easily be their child. People were searching neighborhoods and fields and, you know, every place that you can imagine. Months pass and police continue their relentless search for Trini. Leads pour in every day, prompting detectives to gradually expand their search area. It extended well beyond the, the Rio Grande Valley. There were Trini sightings all over the place. All of those leads had to be pursued and we looked at each one 
very thoroughly and tried to leave no stone unturned. Investigators interview over 100 people. The FBI offers a $15,000 reward. But after nearly two years, there is no sign of the missing little girl, and the trail grows cold. We didn't have any leads. They was all just dead ends. But now, the discovery of a child-sized skeleton could make this case red hot again, if this is Trini. The best shot police have for a quick identification are the teeth that are still in the skull. They immediately rush the remains to the county medical examiner's office. There, a forensic pathologist compares the skull's teeth to Trini's dental records. It's an exact match. At last, police have found the little girl they spent nearly two heartbreaking years looking for. Now a new search begins, a search for justice. Now I know we had a murder case on our hands. We had to look for the person responsible for the murder of Trini Gonzalez. Trini can never tell the story of how she met her tragic fate. But clues contained in her bones may reveal what happened to her and ultimately help catch a killer. But reading what the bones have to say requires a specialist. So police turn to forensic anthropologist Dr. David Glassman at the University of Southern Indiana. Becoming a forensic anthropologist opened up a new world of the skeleton and what the skeleton tells us. Our job is to find not just the big things, but the minute things that tell us the whole story. The whole story is exactly what police need to know. We wanted Dr. Glassman to tell us everything. We wanted to know time of death, how she died, how long she'd been out there. We wanted to know everything he could possibly tell us because this case was important and every clue was going to make a big difference in the case. Police send Trini's skeletal remains to Dr. Glassman's lab. Let's see what we've got here. Forensic anthropologists try to remain objective and detached in every investigation. But in the case of nine-year-old Trini, it's impossible. One of the first things that I recognized as I started taking the remains out was that they were of a child. These are individuals that have not had the opportunity to enjoy their life, and it becomes a very different type of case. As Dr. Glassman begins his examination of Trini's bones, police continue their criminal investigation. They take a fresh look at where Trini lived and those who had contact with her. Neighbors soon come forward with new details about illicit activity in the house where Trini lived. There were allegations of drug use, drug debts, which brought up possibilities of this being somehow narcotics related. If I knew what was going on in that house, I would have gone in there and got her out. But I never knew. If drugs were being dealt out of the house, Trini could have had contact with addicts and criminals. And with the background that we knew from the house, we started looking into all the, all the players that came in and out of that house. Nobody knows what went on in the house better than the woman who mothered Trini, her Aunt Frances. But Frances can't think of anyone who would harm Trini. Police seem to have hit the same dead end they hit when they first investigated Trini's disappearance. But now they have a new witness, Trini's skeleton, and they have Dr. Glassman to question the bones and learn the story they have to tell. Coming up, Dr. Glassman discovers shocking evidence of brutality no little girl should ever have to endure. These three fractures, these are indicative, all three of them, of a pretty powerful blow that took place to this part of the head. And later, when Dr. Warren examines a skull, he struggles to keep his emotions from getting the best of him. I've seen a lot of death and a lot of tragedy. I try not to pile on myself. Uh, I, I would rather just sort of try to keep my distance. When Skeleton Stories returns. Police need forensic anthropologist Dr. David Glassman to answer one question. How did nine-year-old Trini Gonzalez die? As 
he begins his forensic examination of the bones, police re-interview Trini's little sister, Velia. She reveals something new about her Aunt Frances, the woman who mothered Trini since infancy. My aunt was very, she was very quiet to herself, but she would always hit my sister. If my sister did anything little wrong, she would hit her. My sister used to hide in her closet and she would fall asleep in her closet. A scenario started developing dealing with the abuse of the child. And then the focus went a different way, away from kidnapping and looking at all the, uh, uh, the abuse this child had endured. Detectives now believe the very person who was caring for Trini could be involved in her murder. But Francis adamantly denies abusing the child. I don't know what to tell you. I've already given you the whole story like 200 times. Police begin interviewing those who knew Francis best. They start with her live-in boyfriend, Roger Yarborough. It isn't long before detectives grow suspicious of him as well. My good instinct was something was wrong, something happened, something was trying to be covered up to throw us off track. But to pin their evasive suspects down, police need facts. Facts that only Trini Skeleton and Dr. Glassman can provide. The first thing they need to know is how Trini died. Dr. Glassman looks for clues in Trini's skull. The skull is one of the most important parts of the skeleton. It's also an area that is often involved in the death of an individual, either through gunshot or through blunt trauma. Right away, Dr. Glassman sees signs that Trini endured severe head trauma. The facial area right here shows two fractures, one right on the right cheek right here that's caused some separation of the bones right in between my thumbs right here. On the other side of the face, near the eye, right over here, we have a crack in the bone, a small fracture, and here we have also a little bit of separation. These bones should be touching each other, but in this case, they're separated. We also see trauma that's taking place to the cheek and right above the cheek. Then Dr. Glassman discovers a third fracture. Starting right there, there's a fracture that's going a little bit uh, at an angle, a little bit curved, and then goes straight up almost to the top of the skull. In court, a defense attorney might try to argue that the injuries were the result of a fall or accident of some sort. But Dr. Glassman believes the multiple fractures are evidence of at least two separate blows to the head. The fractures would not be a typical type of fracture that you would see in an accident, such as falling down or hitting their head on the sidewalk. Uh, because of the nature of them and being found on both sides and in three different areas, it appears that something more was involved. I can't believe you did that. That's all my money. All my to Dr. Glassman, this unique pattern of fractures point to a very specific cause of death. These three main areas of fractures are indicative, all three of them, of a pretty powerful blow that took place to this part of the head. I can't believe you did that. If the child was pushed or taken violently against a flat surface, such as a wall, and that the face was pushed into that wall, this could have caused the damage to the cheek, damage to the side of the head, as well as then pushed away the bones from each other on the other side. That could, in fact, have caused death to the individual. But there's an alternate scenario that could send Dr. Glassman back to square one. It's possible that the skull had been fractured long after Trini's death, while the skeleton spent almost two years exposed to the elements. Dr. Glassman examines the inside of the skull to see if he can determine the exact time the break occurred. And when you look at the fractures from inside the fracture itself, you can notice that the coloration is the same on the inside of the fracture as the surrounding area of bone. That means they've been exposed to the elements for the same amount of time. And this suggests to me that that fracture has taken place very recent to the time of death of the individual, as opposed to something that may have happened post-mortem. Dr. Glassman immediately reports his findings to investigators. 
Dr. Glassman's evaluation of the case, the trauma to the head could have been the cause of death or fatal to the child. Based on the forensic findings, police now have evidence of how Trini was murdered. Now they're ready to confront their prime suspects, Trini's Aunt Frances and her boyfriend, Roger Yarborough. Detectives question Roger first because they believe he'll be easier to crack. You know, Frances had lots of defenses up, and we really felt like if we were going to get a break, it would be through Roger. Coming up, will the cracks Dr. Glassman found in Trini's skull be enough to make Roger Yarborough crack? We told him we have more information of what might have happened that night. And later, detectives are counting on Dr. Warren to provide enough evidence to convict a suspected killer. You don't want him getting away with it. You just don't want someone like that loose. When Skeleton Stories returns. Police suspect Frances Smithwick of killing her nine-year-old niece, Trini. But detectives can't tie Aunt Frances to the crime, despite allegations that she abused Trini in the past. So they turn to the one person they feel knows more than he's letting on, Frances's boyfriend, Roger. The information is going to be crucial, a lot hanging on, on Roger's statements and the, the forensic evidence that we had. We told him we have good reason to believe that you're involved with the murder of Trini Gonzalez. Police then described the unique pattern of injuries Dr. Glassman found on Trini's skull and their theory as to how she was killed. It's at that point that Roger begins to crack. That's when he opened up and he confessed. After two long years, the shocking details of what happened on the last night of Trini's short life are finally revealed. December 14, 1992, Francis and Roger are about to snort some cocaine. Roger leaves to go get a beer from the kitchen. Her great aunt Francis was cutting some cocaine on a table, and Trini was looking for some attention, as a nine year old obviously would do, and uh, Francis was not paying any attention to her. When Trini accidentally knocks the drugs to the floor, Francis is enraged. She strikes Trini so hard on the left side of the face that it fractures the skull above the ear. The blow is so powerful that it sends the right side of Trini's head slamming into the wall. The results are two more fractures to Trini's skull, exactly how Dr. Glassman described. Hearing the commotion, Roger rushes back into the room. When he came back to the room with the drinks, Trini was on the floor. And she's convulsing, and blood is coming from her head. But Trini is still alive, just barely breathing. <laughs> Francis then gave a pillow to her boyfriend and said, finish the, finish the job. Do it. Do it. Roger got the pillow and put it on Trini's face and suffocated her. After that, he went into the bathroom and uh, threw up. Okay, with all the cocaine on the floor? I don't think so. Francis and Roger dragged Trini's dead body into an isolated section of woods. They then concoct a phony kidnapping story to explain her disappearance. The confession, backed up by the detailed forensic evidence, is enough for police to finally charge Francis with the murder of nine-year-old Trini Gonzalez. Roger is also charged. In court, Dr. Glassman takes the stand to help make sure there's justice for Trini. When you're holding their skull and you're leading a jury through, these are the fractures that happened to this human being, that happened to this individual. It's very, very powerful. The jury listens to Dr. Glassman in rapt attention as he corroborates Roger Yarborough's confession. Glassman was our silver bullet in this case. I mean, he confirmed 
what Yarbrough was saying, and, and that made the case for us. The jury deliberates for less than an hour before they deliver their verdict. Guilty. Francis gets 99 years in prison, and Roger, who pled guilty, gets 45. Francis appeals her conviction, and her appeal is denied. The verdict brings a sense of closure to Trini's family. But nothing will ever take away the pain of losing her. My grandma did not hurt anybody. She was a little angel. We're supposed to be family. You're not supposed to hurt family. She took my best friend away from me. She took my sister. It just hurt me so much. Justice for little Trini may never have been found without the forensic expertise of Dr. Glassman. Dr. Glassman's work in this case just meshed everything together. He brought science into a case and he played a tremendous part in helping put Trini's killer behind bars. I am so pleased that Trini was found and identified and the people who committed the crime have been sentenced and put away. At the same time, Trini herself is not better off and never will be. And so I'm not sure that I can find any solace in that. She's not going to return. Very sad. Coming up, in hopes of giving investigators the evidence they so desperately need, Dr. Warren turns to his last resort. So what we're left with in this case then is a non-conventional way of looking at identification. But that's all we had in this case, so we went with it. That's next on Skeleton Stories. Florida afternoon. Detective Jeffrey Raker and his team comb through the woods on a painstaking search. Earlier in the day, they received an anonymous tip that a human skull had been spotted somewhere in this remote stretch of forest. But after several hours of searching, police are beginning to believe that the call might have been a hoax. Then, they stumble onto a grisly scene that proves the call was no joke. And there was a skull with the lower jawbone in the middle of this field. It's clear right away that the skull is human. The search team methodically scours the surrounding woods for more remains. But their search turns up only a few more bones, an arm and two ribs. They have a theory on why they may be unable to find a more complete skeleton. A lot of animals in that area have been uh, eaten on the body. The hours long search will now become part of a much longer investigation that could last weeks, months, or years. Anytime you find a skull or body part or bones, you, you need to positively identify who they are. Police believe the skull and bones may contain clues to the victim's identity and how that person died. But they need an expert to unlock the story. No skeleton is boring. They turn to forensic anthropologist Dr. Michael Warren of the University of Florida. There's always a fascinating story attached to each of these cases. And every skeleton that I've seen has had something about it that's fascinating. Uh, and that's the great thing about my job. But Dr. Warren will have to do this particular job with just the victim's skull, arm, bone, and two ribs. Even in cases where you only have a few of the bones of the skeleton, you still would do your normal analyses determining the biological profile of that individual, male or female, ancestry, stature, and age at death. First, he examines the skull. The eyebrow region can tell him whether the person is male or female. And the male, if we put him sideways, we see that he has these very distinct brow ridges. But the skull found in the woods has no distinctive brow ridges. 
Dr. Warren believes this person is female. If you look at most females, it's very, very smooth. So when we look at this one, she has some very slight uh, raised areas above her eyes, but they certainly don't protrude. Next, Dr. Warren examines the teeth, which can help him determine whether the person is a child or an adult. All of the teeth are completely developed. That tells us that this person is an adult. Then, Dr. Warren examines the skull's nasal cavity, which helps him identify her race. Europeans tend to have this nasal seal that's very prominent, where you can actually take a pen and put it on the nose and it'll stay there. And if that nose was guttered like an African-American's nose, that pen would not stay there. Now Dr. Warren knows the remains are that of a white adult female. But he isn't finished yet. He measures the arm bone to estimate the person's height. He discovers she was short for an adult female, no more than five feet, three inches tall. So we're still able to get the four biological profile components that forensic anthropologists normally try to get. Upon receiving Dr. Warren's profile, Detective Raker doesn't even have to search the missing person's database. He spent the past year investigating the disappearance of a petite white woman named Olivia Pearson. Olivia fits Dr. Warren's description to a T. If the remains are indeed hers, it would be a tragic end for a woman who was just 35 years old. Olivia was an outgoing, hard-working woman who owned a small housekeeping business. Those who knew her had only nice things to say about her. From what I can gather with the neighbors and her friends of her, she's a very likable person. Why would someone like Olivia disappear so suddenly? Detective Raker believes the answers were there when he first began his investigation into Olivia's disappearance a year ago. July 23, 1986. Detective Raker responds to a frantic phone call from a woman named Ellen Fields. Ellen tells him that she and her best friend, Olivia Pearson, had plans to go out to lunch. But when Ellen arrived at Olivia's house, there was no answer. Instead, she saw something shocking inside. Right away, Detective Raker suspects that something is wrong. There's what appear to be blood smears on the door. It's on the carpet. Uh, you can tell there had been quite a bit of blood on the floor, and somebody had uh, attempted to, to scrub it up and do a cleanup job. But few cleanup jobs are good enough to stand up to a luminol test. When the luminol spray makes contact with even trace amounts of blood, it emits a fluorescent glow under black light, and Olivia's home begins to glow with signs that something horrific happened there. You could see the small hand prints on the carpet, and you can see the blood and the hand smears. To detectives, the amount of blood and the attempt to conceal point to a grim scenario. There was uh, evidence that somebody could have been killed or they were hurt very bad. Assuming Olivia or someone was assaulted in the house, police begin searching for suspects. Neighbors and friends immediately tell police about the man who shared the house with Olivia, her boyfriend, Jesse Stanton. And according to neighbors, Jesse had a history of violence. She's in a, a domestic violent type relationship where she has been hurt. I expect to have my dinner ready. Gone from a simple pull of the hair or a push to being punched. He actually broke her collarbone. In June 1986, Olivia pressed charges against Jesse and he was convicted and jailed for domestic abuse. Friends hoped that would be the end of their relationship, but Olivia had other ideas. She let him back and uh, we're going on a trial basis. Detective Raker hauls Jesse in for questioning. And the story he tells police is suspicious. His story is that he didn't hear anything. He's a hard sleeper. Detective Raker strongly suspects that Jesse is somehow linked to Olivia's disappearance. But the presence of blood alone is not enough. Without a body, police cannot arrest him for murder. In order to prosecute a murder, you have to have a victim. There had been, at that time, two, maybe three times in the United States that they were actually able to uh, successfully prosecute someone for a murder and did not have the body. Detective Raker and his team search a 20-mile radius but find no trace of Olivia. A year passes and the case grows ice cold. 
the police were concerned that uh, they would never uncover the uh, remains and uh, perhaps this case would uh, ultimately not be um, prosecutable. Now with the discovery of the skull and bones in the woods, police may finally have the evidence they need to make an arrest. But even though Dr. Warren has provided a biological profile, authorities need proof that the partial skeleton in the woods is actually Olivia. The easiest way to identify a skull is to compare its teeth to dental x-rays. But again, police hit a dead end. In this case, there were no dental records to be found. These bones and this entire case will be filed away on a shelf if Detective Raker can't find a way to connect the remains to Olivia Pearson. Coming up, investigators turn to Dr. Warren for answers, but the bones are offering up few clues. Of course, the less bones that you have, the more likely it is that you won't find any evidence. When Skeleton Stories continues. Authorities are counting on Dr. Warren to tie the remains found in the Florida woods to missing person Olivia Pearson. Without this positive ID, they will not have enough evidence to build a case against her suspected killer, Jesse Stanton. You don't want him getting away with it, and you just don't want someone like that loose. As a next step, Dr. Warren probes investigators on the details of Olivia and Jesse's relationship. There was strong reason to believe that this disappeared woman had, uh, had suffered some trauma uh, in that home. The reports of domestic abuse give Dr. Warren an idea. If he can track down medical records from previous hospital visits, he may be able to match them to the remains found in the woods. By comparing a skull's sinus cavity side by side with an x-ray, a forensic anthropologist can easily make a positive ID. Frontal sinuses are unique to each individual. Their shape, their outline is considered a forensic fingerprint. But Dr. Warren has dealt another setback. Those medical records were not available, probably because she never sought treatment for those uh, traumatic injuries. In many cases where uh, someone's being abused, they're not permitted to go to the hospital for treatment uh, by the person that, that's beating them. Without dental records or x-rays, the investigation looks like it might grind to a halt. But Dr. Warren has one more unorthodox trick up his sleeve. So what we're left with in this case then is a non-conventional way of looking at identification, a technique called video superimposition. Video superimposition is a method which you take your specimen, which is a skull, and you superimpose a photograph of someone who is believed to be that decedent. It's truly um, an art and a science. If the video images of the skull and photo sync up along a series of matching points, Dr. Warren can make a positive identification. But first, he must obtain just the right still photograph of Olivia. We had to send a picture, a front frontal face picture of the victim to Dr. Warren. It really puts a personal face uh, on the case. Then you get to see what that person looked like. Um, and, and that is, that's emotional when you really now then connect your work with the actual personal tragedy that's involved. But Dr. Warren knows he can't let his emotions get in the way of the task at hand. I've seen a lot of death and a lot of tragedy. I think we're pretty good at catching ourselves before we get too much emotionally invested in it. The video superimposition process requires two video cameras. Dr. Warren focuses one camera on the photo of Olivia. The other is focused on the skull. The images are then fed into a video mixer, which allows them to be blended to see if there is a fit. The key is to make sure the angle of the skull exactly matches the angle of Olivia's face in the photo. Yeah, Laurel's is uh, putting dowels into the ear holes, and that gives us an axis of how to orient the, the skull to the photograph. Once Dr. Warren has the proportions matched, he compares key features on Olivia's face to the skull. The jawbone, the width of the eyes, the height of the forehead, the cheekbones, and the teeth. It's a very long process of trying to evaluate the photograph and look at the position of the head in that photo and approximating that by manipulating the skull under the other camera. After a painstaking examination, 
Dr. Warren sees haunting evidence that Olivia's facial features fit the skull perfectly. In fact, Olivia's photo almost seems to bring the skull to life. The job Dr. Warren's team did with the, uh, the picture and the skull and put it all together to say that yes, we've identified the victim. They sent a report back saying it did. They believed that this was her. Prosecutors now believe they have enough evidence to convince a jury that this is Olivia. But now they want to know if the skull holds any clues to how she died. Cause of death is, a, is an issue in any homicide that you, you're prosecuting. This challenge once again falls to Dr. Warren, who focuses on the network of fractures on Olivia's skull. They had a fracture of her maxilla, which is this area uh, that extends from her left eye socket. She had nasal bone fractures on both sides. She also had a fracture that extends down through what's called the infraorbital foramen, which provides the feeling for the left side of your face. That must have been very painful. But the fractures are in various stages of healing, some years old, some more recent. This healing process indicates that they were not caused at the time of death. You never had dinner ready. All Dr. Warren can conclude is that the fractures fit the pattern of the many cases of domestic violence that ultimately result in homicide. We have a lot of cases where people have been abused their whole life, uh, and that's evident. Uh, their bones tell that life history, and they're at risk uh, to end up in our laboratory. But without a specific cause of death, the problem will lie in proving, beyond a reasonable doubt, that Olivia was murdered and that Jesse killed her. Despite this obstacle, Prosecutors hope a jury will take into consideration the history of abuse and connect the violent dots. When you put everything together, uh, you're looking at the, the blood in the house, uh, violent history of the past, what we're finding with the skull, the totality of the whole thing, she was beat to death. Prosecutors may never know exactly what happened to Olivia in her final hours, but based on Dr. Warren's forensic evidence and a year-long police investigation, they develop a theory. On the night of her death, Olivia returns home late after an evening out with friends. And he had been waiting at home, and they got into an argument uh, over her being with her friends. Where do you think you're going? Don't worry about it. I'm just going to bed. No, you're not. Investigators believe that a fight breaks out and Jesse begins to beat her. She bleeds profusely. But the attack leaves no evidence on the bones. It's perfectly plausible that she died of some uh, type of closed head injury. She may have been knocked unconscious and her airway occluded. There's so many different scenarios that you can think of that would have resulted in her death without marking the bone. That night, Jesse tries to clean up the blood, then drives to a remote area where he dumps Olivia's body. He just left her out to be eaten by animals. For the next 12 months, he gets away with murder. As long as Olivia's body isn't found, Jesse knows that authorities can't arrest him. He thought he was able to outsmart us. To him, it was just a game, see how long he could get away with it. Coming up, investigators are ready to charge Jesse Stanton with Olivia's murder. But will Dr. Warren's evidence hold up in court? If the jury comes back and just a little doubt is in their mind, we cannot go back and recharge him. When Skeleton Stories returns, the strength of Dr. Warren's findings, Detective Raker heads out to arrest Jesse Stanton for the murder of his ex-girlfriend, Olivia Pearson. We went to one house, and they said, he knows you're looking for him. He's, uh, he, he's waiting on a ride. So I went down there, and sure enough, he was back in the, the shadows waiting on his ride. So we picked him up, and I arrested him. Under interrogation, Jesse tries to play the same games he's played with detectives in the past. But Jesse is about to learn that it's a whole new playing field. 
when Detective Souter told him, says, well, we have found her, he just clammed up and said he wanted his attorney at that point. He knew it was over, and he just shut up. As the case goes to court, prosecutors are faced with the challenging case. Without a murder weapon, a positive ID, a confession, or an exact cause of death, it will not be easy to convince a jury beyond a reasonable doubt that Jesse murdered Olivia. If the jury comes back and just a little doubt is in their mind and they don't convict him, we cannot go back and recharge him. It's a double jeopardy rule. The trial begins on February 10, 1988. Prosecutor Moore's first challenge is to convince the jury that the remains found in the woods are those of Olivia Pearson. The highlight of Dr. Warren's testimony is showing the jury the video superimposition process. Then all of a sudden this picture comes up right there over the skull of the victim. I think the old saying is that a picture is worth a thousand words. His analysis provides strong evidence that the skull belongs to Olivia Pearson, but it also goes a step further. It really personalizes that victim and reminds everyone on the jury that we're talking about a person. And to superimpose that photograph on the top of a skull uh, really drives the point home that that person's no longer here. The jury sees Olivia Pearson smiling back at them, bringing her skull to life. And it's her skull that Dr. Warren uses to tell the jury about the pattern of brutal abuse Olivia endured during her final months. They also were able to show us uh, where her nose had been broken uh, from the skull and a cheekbone had been broken and uh, had healed. So she had several healed fractures of the face that were consistent with the beating. Prosecutors also point out that the defendant, Jesse Stanton, had been convicted of brutally abusing Olivia and had recently been released from jail. During closing arguments, the prosecution asked the jury to connect the dots of evidence. The video superimposition, Jesse Stanton's history of violence, crime scene photos of blood throughout the house, and Jesse's suspicious story about the night Olivia disappeared. After deliberating for just three hours, the jury reaches a verdict guilty of first-degree murder. Jesse is sentenced to life without parole for the murder of Olivia Pearson. His appeal has been denied. It's always gratifying uh, to the prosecutor and to the family and the police when a case like this gets solved and someone's prosecuted and convicted and, and punished for the crime. But without Dr. Warren's work, Jesse might never have even been arrested. Dr. Warren's role in this investigation is uh, he really brought that victim to life in the courtroom. Olivia's family also finds some solace, knowing that justice has finally been served. I think the family was very gratified. The killer of their loved one was actually found guilty by a jury and serving a life sentence. For Dr. Warren, there is nothing more gratifying than making sure Jesse Stanton will never abuse or murder another woman again. When my analysis plays a, a major uh, role in the prosecution of a killer, uh, then that gives me great satisfaction.